I'm not going to be talking about ontology for pathology informatics, but rather ontology for imaging informatics quite generally. Um, and wh what I say is nicely complementary to what Jason was talking about earlier. So there is a big problem in creating interoperability um, at every level within a domain like imaging, uh, particularly biomedical imaging. Um, and there is a specific problem in creating interoperability when it comes to describing the data, which means using language in order to create metadata about, for instance, image data. And this talk is about how we can bring about a situation where we use language consistently in talking about data. And uh, the handout it relates to a textbook for building ontologies, which is going to appear in the next few weeks. Uh, the, the idea behind this textbook is that We've been trying to work out the principles for building good ontologies, which means to say good controlled vocabularies for describing data, for some years now, at least since the gene ontology in 1998-1999. And we are gradually beginning to be in a situation where we can lay down certain best practices, which have been tested over and over again in multiple different kinds of ontologies. And this textbook is about those best practices. It's the how to build ontologies. Basic formal ontology is a kind of encapsulation of those best practices, which is already being used by about 160 ontology-based research projects around the world. And uh, it's going to play a certain role in what I have to say next. Now, in the olden days, biology data looked like this, and nowadays it looks more like this. But we still need to be able to interpret and understand data like this in terms of the old biological terms relating to things like diseases, cells, and so forth. And so there's a problem. How do we make this kind of data accessible to people who want to think about, for instance, diseases? How do we do biology across genome data? And how do we link the kinds of phenomena which you represented here or to, to data like this? I think I, I may be using the wrong slides, which would not be good. Uh, but so, how do we use, how do we link the two kinds of data? Now the answer uh, is variously called semantic enhancement, or ontology annotation, or tagging, where an ontology is a controlled, structured vocabulary to support such annotation. So we. Um, we do what the gene ontology community has been doing for 16 years now. We take various different bodies of literature or data, and we tag those bodies of literature or data using standardized expressions within the gene ontology so that everyone can find all the literature relating to, for instance, a given biological process in a given species, in a given part of a given cell, where a given molecular function is being exercised. We all know how to do that. The problem is that for this to be useful, it has to be constrained. It's very easy to build ontologies. There is, there is now rather well-designed software for building your own ontology, in part because of the success of the gene ontology. And so everyone wants to build his or her own ontology. Well, and they do it separately. So they do it in such a way that they recreate the old problem of data silos, which ontology technology was designed to solve. So how do we constrain ontology building? How do we stop people from creating their own ontologies? And how do we bring it about that people working in discipline A 
build an ontology in tandem with the ontology being built by people in discipline B when A scientists and B scientists have to work together. Well, we, there was one big success even before the gene ontology, which is the international system of units. And what we really need is an international system of ontologies, which would bring about on the level of natural language expressions the same kind of consistency, consistency not merely of the units used, but of the labels used for those units across all sciences. So we have quantitative comparability of data, and what we need is qualitative comparability of data, qualitative comparability of the ways data are described. Now, this fact has been recognized by the scientific community. If you count the number of times the words ontology or ontologies are used in PubMed abstracts, there is a constant rise, which is more rapid than the rise in the size of uh, PubMed itself by a statistically significant degree. Um, but if you examine which of these uh, mentions of ontology refer to which ontologies, it's nearly always the go, the gene ontology which is being used. So the other ontologies uh, such as SNOMED or FMA or UMLS or MESH are used to a, an almost vanishingly small degree when compared to the gigantic turquoise ontology called GO. So GO is doing something right. Now what is the GO doing? It's providing a multi-species, that is to say species neutral, open source language for tagging primarily genomic data or data about gene products. The, it, it's multi-species because it was invented by biologists who were working at the time when they wanted to draw conclusions from mouse experiments or fly experiments for human disease research. And if you want to draw such conclusions, you have to be able to compare mouse genomes with human genomes in light of their biological relevance to things like disease. And so you need a disease-neutral labeling system, which contains disease-neutral terms like cell division. Now, in this way, the gene ontology contributed to the cumulativity of scientific results in just the way that the international system of units contributed to the cumulativity of scientific results. And now we need to move to new additions. So everything on the left of the blue part you've seen already, but now we're going to add a new kind of process to the foundry suite of ontologies, which are protocol-driven processes or, or plan specification-based processes, processes involved in studies, investigations, experiments. And that is the domain of the ontology for biomedical investigations. And OB would be the imaging branch of the ontology. Uh, sorry, the imaging ontology would be the imaging branch of OB. It will, it will have a separate life in some ways for grant funding purposes, but in, 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 in the end, it's going to be a branch of OB. And so, um, well, this is just another view of the same structure. OB gives you a basic view of what an investigation is. So we start by creating a specimen, which means we need some kind of protocol for creating the specimen, which will be specified in the uh, in the protocol for the entire study. And then we have material processing, and the material processing will, will yield a, a new specimen, a modified specimen, stained or whatever other kind of processing we use. And then we assay that specimen on the basis of an assay objective, and that too will be specified in the protocol. This assay will lead to something like a measurement datum, which would be the equivalent of an image in the imaging domain. 
And this, this output, the measurement datum or the image, is then subject to another set of processes, which are data processing. And they too will be specified in the protocol. And then the output in this particular kind of investigation would be a data item, a result, a, a publication, a database, something like that. Now, the question is, what are data items or measurement data in BFO terms? We know what specimens are. They are things. They're made of molecules. We know what processes are, but what are the data? And um, the answer is that the data are entities which fall within the domain of the information artifact ontology. They are artifacts, which means they're created by deliberate design, and they are information artifacts. And what that means is two things. First of all, they can be exactly copied. So the, 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 think about it. If, if you have information such as data in a database, then you can exactly copy that information. And secondly, they are about something. So an image is an image of something. These are two features of information artifacts which form the basis of the information artifact ontology. And the information artifact ontology covers things like software algorithms, patient data, and then image data, flow cytometry data, and so forth. And the, the information artifact ontology is already being used in multiple different uh, places as a consistent representation of data about data. Now, the, 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 some of you may have heard of the Dublin Core, um, which is also intended to be a consistent representation of data about data. It is problematic in many ways. Uh, so the main, uh, the main idea within the Dublin Core is the idea of a resource. Um, and a resource is anything which can have a web address, according to the Dublin Core. Or anything which can be identified, according to the Dublin Core. So there are problems with the Dublin Court. The IAO is, de is designed in such a way as to raise the level of data about data to the point where it can be an object of scientific research and of scientific utility. All right, so this is the new suite, and the images, image data, image assays are going to be, roughly speaking, lined up as follows. And they are, the images and the image data and the assays are going to be connected intimately with all of the ontologies re which relate to patient data at each of the levels of granularity which are of interest, from anatomy all the way down to chemistry. So, this is again the OB pipeline. And the, these are some examples of the OB pipeline I'm looking. Here is the OB pipeline applied to imaging assays. So we've been through this. We have specimen collection, extraction, purification, the imaging assay, and then data transformation. All of these terms are already in OB. They're already defined. You see that IAO is used here as a data item. The, they're all defined in such a way that the definitions are linked to counterpart definitions on the side of the objects used, for instance, the material specimen. All right, uh, now just a little bit on the information artifact ontology. So you can find it here. You can also find it in the bio portal. And um, the relation is about, is, is the core relation of the information artifact ontology, information content entities are what is communicated when an email is sent or when a database is copied from one laptop to another or when I say uh, information content entities are what is communicated then I say something and you all hear it there's something which is passed back and forth between us and that something is about something else and that's the, the, the they are the two key features of information artifacts that I was referring to earlier And uh, so this is the final slide. Um, what we want to do is to 
try and create all of the terms that we need at a very high level to describe things like imaging equipment, imaging equipment settings, imaging equipment parameters, inputs into imaging equipment, including specimens, processes which specimens can be subjected to, such as staining, uh, the assays, what we do with the objects which are the inputs to imaging assays, the outputs of imaging assays, which are data, the processes which those outputs are subjected to, data transformations. We need an ontology of statistics, which are used in data transformations, which we uh, already are developing. And all of those things then need to be connect connected to ontologies relating to different kinds of patient data at different levels of granularity, roughly along the lines which I just described. So that's the plan. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, that's a very good question. So I, I just, just assume that the patients, uh, the human beings involved in the loop were all patients. <laughs> but there, there, there are also pathologists and radiologists and so forth. Um, so we have another ontology, which I haven't mentioned, called the Ontology for General Medical Science. And the Ontology for General Medical Science is designed to do for the clinic what OB does for the lab. And in the ontology for general medical science, we deal with things like diagnosis, diagnos di diagnosis process, lab test as ordered by a clinician for a particular patient, and with uh, things like radiological analysis and radio radiology-based diagnosis. Now, because these ontologies are all built like Lego, that they all fit well together, the what clinical aspects of image analysis are going to be attachable to this pipeline with, without any problem just by taking the relevant parts of OGMS. And we will need some parts of OGMS for the imaging ontology framework in any case. Uh, so we can do it, but I didn't anticipate that you would ask me about it. Good. So, the, the, first of all, the, the gene ontology exists in two ways, let me say. So first of all, there is what you can think of as the editor's version of the gene ontology, the, the, the version that, that they use uh, for quality control and so forth. And then there is the published version, which is designed to be maximally user-friendly. Now, the published version is a, a directed acyclical graph which includes multiple parentage. That is to say, the same, same term can have more than one parent in the hierarchy. Now, ontologically speaking, that is a problem. If you are an ontological, on, uh, if you're interested in ontology quality, you want to avoid multiple parentage. The main reason for that is because the, the strategy for cre creating good definitions 
is to, t you want to define term A, you find the parent term B, and then you ask yourself the question, what is it about A's, I'm sorry, what is it about those B's which are A's, which makes them A's? So an A is a B which does something, which sees. Uh, a, a, a human being is an animal which is rational. That's what Socrates said. So that's the idea. If a, if a term in an ontology has two parents, immediately you have a problem in giving the correct definition because you don't know whether you, you should say A is a B which sees or whether A is a D which cues. So an example, of, uh, uh, an embarrassingly bad example to make the point, you might classify a, car, a red car as a car which is red and as a red thing which is a car. So you have two ways classifying cars. Should we define a car, a red car, as a red thing which is a car or should we define a red car as a car which is red? Now I think it's obvious what the correct answer to that question is. And that fact means that we should not have two parents for red car. And so in the editor's version of the gene ontology, experimentally at least, they are creating a gene ontology with single parentage. This means that the definitions can be created all following the same principle, and it means that creating the definitions will serve as a quality control on the ontology itself. Now, that, so that's your first question. The second question is actually closely related to the first question. SNOMED doesn't do any of that. SNOMED does not have a carefully crafted um, graph theoretic representation of a domain which is such that we can find terms because we know where they will naturally occur within a graph. The result is that very, there are very many cases where if you have a, a, a need, a clinical need to, to, to label a certain phenomenon, you might have multiple choices within SNOMED which seem to differ very li little amongst themselves, but which appear in different parts of the SNOMED, I won't say monster, uh, thing. Um, and that's a problem, because an ontology which is well built should have a natural place for each phenomenon, and not be such that the same phenomenon should be in seven different places. But still, that doesn't So, snow... I would say that in a room, I, most people in this room are pathologists. So in a room full of pathologists, SNOMED is a well-known devil. Uh, in a room full of clinicians, SNOMED is still not very uh, well-known. Um, so SNOMED is certainly on the rise. More and more people know what SNOMED is, and it's going to play a much bigger role in the future. Uh, I am hoping that as it becomes more important, so also the need for some kind of ontological architecture uh, will also become more recognized. So the problem with SNOMED is that the things you can do analytically with a well-built ontology, the Lego brick features, the features of tandem reuse of terms here in other ontologies there, the, those features are not uh, consistently developed in SNOMED. Yes. Yep. 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 So, the first way, way, uh, if you're lucky is that there will already be an identified subset of Go, that they're called Go Slims. And there are multiple Go Slims. There are many Go Slims which are species specific. So there is a mouse Go Slim, for instance. There may be a Go Slim which meets your needs. 
Uh, the second strategy is to look at something called Ontofox. Ontofox is a web application which takes ontologies and which allows you to choose those terms in the ontology which you need, and then it will generate for you a new sub-ontology which will take all the things that you get anyway because they're tied to the things you need. Um, I think probably that will serve your purposes. The, the beta cell genomics ontology, which I referred to, was built in roughly the same way, but then the authors of it added more specific beta cell terms for their own purposes. And I guess that's what you would be doing. And, and at that point, then, you can start giving it a title and publishing it. And provided you reuse terms from existing ontologies in the way I've described, you will be doing something which is exactly the thing you should be doing. You're creating an ontology for a specific purpose which your colleagues in your specific domain can recognize. They will reuse it and so the terms will be become reused in, in the right way and benefit also the authors of those terms in the original gene ontology or wherever it might be. So you are contributing to the cumulativity of science. What we have all too often is the equivalent of people inventing new ways of measuring time, so uh, uh, Pittsburgh minutes or something, and measuring the their, 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 their events in their experiment using Pittsburgh minutes because they, they think it would be a nice idea and they might get a better grant if they have their own minutes. Um. Yep. Yes, so there are several things to be said. First of all, there is something called the human phenotype ontology. I don't know if you've heard of that. That, I believe, is probably the, the most um, uh, useful and successful of the disease-related ontologies that we have, uh, in the sense that they have actually demonstrated that using it can give rise to more accurate diagnoses, uh, and they have a lot of statistical evidence that, that the ontology brings benefits like that. But the human phenotype ontology is focused primarily on genetic disease. And for other kinds of diseases, there is nothing comparable. Um, so there is something called the symptom ontology, but that's a rather small ontology, and I don't think that it is well bound into the ontology framework that I've been talking about. There is um, PATO, as you mentioned. PATO is a generic phenotype ontology. So it's about things like length or extended length or circular or red. Or, and then you can define things like the redness of a rash using the PATO term red. And then you would need another term for rash. Some of that work has been done. Um, SNOMED. Uh, has quite a lot of content along those lines. Um, but it's not a dimension that has really been um, systematized from the point of view of capturing the space of disease phenotypes to the degree that we have that for genetic diseases. And um, I, I, I just record that there is this need. I think that, that the, the, um, there is something called the human disease ontology, which is a very large ontology of diseases. Some of those, the, it's very large and not all the terms are defined. Some of the terms are defined using features along the lines that you described, but without the necessary symptom, uh, system. And the reason for that is precisely because there is no good source for feature term. PATO is too generic and no one has done the work 
for the specific kinds of features which relate to disease. 